That's weird. Okay. So we're back. We have the orange circle. Our basic categories of memory are ones that you can only read from and ones that you can both read from and write to. So your standard kind, your read-only memory, is known as ROM. There's a bunch of different flavors of ROM. Uh, computer chips are generally ROMs. You can't, you know, usually write to them. Although the new kind of flash memory, that that is essentially a type of. It's the same kind of stuff that's on a chip, but it's not hard hardwired in. Basically, it's, it's writable. But read-only. We're familiar with it. DVDs, CDs that you buy them in the store, and then you you know you can't overwrite them. That's your read-only memory. The other kind is readable and writable, and that has two main flavors as well. Non-volatile read and write means the memory stays in when the power goes away. And if you have something like a flash ROM, right, there's no battery in there, it's just once it's written to, whatever you've written there stays there for a long time even though there's no power in it. Uh, other stuff like tape drives, if any of you dig around in your grandparents' attic and you see uh, old cassettes, you might have seen them at some time or in a museum somewhere. Yeah. Tapes were also, cassette tapes were also non-volatile. Your volatile memory is RAM, okay? RAM stands for uh, random access memory, and we'll talk a little bit later about what that means. But essentially, RAM is volatile because once the power goes away, all the things that are in memory get erased. And the reason why is there are little tiny, 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 tiny switches inside, and when the voltage is applied to those switches, it can hold them in either the up or the down position, when the voltage goes away, all that force required to hold the up switches in the up position goes away and they all go out, go to zeros. So that's basically what happens. Now, next thing, data management access models. Okay, there are three main flavors of access to your data. So you store data somewhere and the question is, well, how do you get to it? Well, the first one, is sequential access memory. Basically, you have to go through things in a particular sequence to get what you're looking for. And this is the oldest. Uh, it's essentially, it's analogous to a book, right? If you want to, uh, well, it's not even really analogous to a book anyway. That's more like direct access. It is like a tape drive. So again, if you've ever seen your grandparents' old, you know, whatever, they have tapes, basically you have to spool it to wherever you want to play. Okay? There's no way to just jump ahead. And when I was thinking like a book, I was thinking like, well, if you're just reading through, but of course, you know, you don't normally just read a book straight through if you're looking for something, right? Like you have a phone book, you crack it open to the page you want. That's essentially more like direct access memory. Okay. So anyway, sequential access memory, you have to access data in a specific sequence. Everything that's in the memory is in there in a sequence. If you want to get through to a particular point in that memory, you have to read through it all. Okay? And what that does is it generates some kind of initial seek delay to find the starting point. For example, if you have this big spool of tape and you say, well, I want to read something that's in the middle of it, and your tape is at the start of the tape drive, right? You gotta take a minute to spool all the way through to that midpoint. That's your seek time. Okay? Now, once upon a time, this kind of uh, sequential access was very cheap. So like 25 years ago, you could buy a tape drive with a lot of capacity, but it was pretty slow, okay? And it was much cheaper than ordinary hard drives. These days, the only time you really see tape drives is for uh, super, uh, super rugged computers. Basically, like if you have some military operation, you're climbing up in mountains and stuff, and you know that this shit's gonna get dropped a few times on the way there, tape drives are a lot sturdier than hard drives, right? Hard drives, you know, if you drop those, the, you know, the head can get out of alignment, and then it's just useless then you have a paperweight. So, yeah, they still exist, but there's a good chance you're never going to see them except in some kind of weird legacy system. There's not really any other good reason for tape drives to exist these days. Uh, okay, next time is direct access storage. So direct access uh, combines three different models, and the easy way to describe this is as a hard drive. So I'm going to draw a picture of a hard drive. Anybody ever crack open a hard drive, see what's in there? Like your, your laptop shit itself and you're like, well, as long as it's broken, I might as well take a look and see what's in there. No? Nobody? Super strong magnets. Well, there is some magnetism in there, but super strong is probably a stretch. Okay. So basically, tape drive looks like, uh, not a tape drive, hard drive looks like this. There's a cylinder, 
All right, so we're gonna, this is called the disc or the platter. More approved term, okay? And there's also a little bar that hovers over it and contains the drive head. Okay? And the rest of it is all just a bunch of circuitry. So, so, okay. So the part that it reads with right, is right here. And it would be nice to be able to put that at an angle, but let's actually, we'll do that. Okay? So this is the part here that actually reads. I'm just blacking that in for you. Okay. So this is basically what a hard drive is. And that, you know, the circle there spools around. And over here, you know, if you look in it, there's circuitry of some kind. Circuitry, chips, whatever. Okay, but this is the, the main operating point. So there's a platter that spins around and there's a drive arm that moves to where it needs to go. Now each segment of the hard drive is arranged in what's called a track. And what this means is once the drive finds the correct spot, it can go zoop and it can spin around and read that track. Okay, so it can read that in sequence. It doesn't usually try to bounce around all over the disk drive. The data is arranged in the tracks, and so if you have a file there, it can read it in like one continuous sweep. Okay? And that's the basic idea. Does this remind anybody of anything you might have seen? What is this? What other system that you might have seen in your life works like? Yes. Like a record player. Uh, so for the people who were born in this century, please explain what is a record player? You're correct. Do people, does anyone here not know what a record player is? It's okay, right? Record player, vinyl, you guys have heard of vinyl? We just call them records, but yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a lot like a record player, right? So what do you do? You buy some album and it's got 10 songs on it, but the only song you want to hear is the fourth track. So what do you do? What do you do when you, do you just start it at track one and let it play for 12 minutes till it gets to that fourth track? No, we're busy. What do we do? Yes. Pick up the needle, move it, drop it down, right? Or you press some button on your system and it does that for you, but that's the idea. Same thing with a hard drive, right? If it were sequential access, you'd have to play all the way through like you do on a cassette. This kind, direct access, it's a combination, right? There's some sequential because when you get to a track, you can't go to a specific point in the track, but you can lift it up to the start, right? Like if there's one piece that you wanna hear, like a minute into the fourth track, it's a little dicey to try to drop the needle right at that point, right? You can drop it at the start of the track, but maybe not really in the middle, okay? So that's what we're talking about there. So hard drives basically, again, if you know what vinyl is, those kind of record players, yeah, that's what we're doing. And then hard drives work like that, optical drives, right? Like your CD, DVD readers, same thing. Last one, random access memory, okay? Random access memory, or RAM, it has an extremely magical property. The magical property of it is whatever, wherever the data is located in RAM, it takes almost exactly the same time to reach it. There is some tiny little variation because, you know, electrons don't teleport and there's parts of the memory that are physically further away than others. Yeah, there's a tiny difference, but it's basically, for all practical purposes, it's the same time, okay? <laughs> And this is magic. This makes it wonderful for many uses, like doing computations. Okay, so let me return to this picture here. Okay, you can see wherever the drive head is at any moment of time, if you want at any moment of time, you have to move it to read a new track, right? You have to physically move it, and that takes a little bit of time. That's another seek time, and on a hard drive, it's usually a few milliseconds, okay? RAM, there's not that kind of seek time there, right? If you want to read something that's stored in one place and read something from another place and read something from another place, there's no physical time to move that drive head around and replace it in the new location, okay? So that's why RAM is a lot faster. The other thing, RAM all operates at electronic speeds, right? Hard drives, they have to operate at physical speeds. They have to physically pick up that thing and move it over and spin the disk around. And it's a lot slower than, you know, just electrons zipping around through circuits. Okay. So that's, those are your three basic types. Sequential access, direct access, 
and random access. Okay. Back to our memory types, right? So read-only memory we've discussed about. Uh, flash memory, though, is one that we've seen, you know, I don't know. I think I saw my first one, let's say, about 15 years ago. A friend of my brother's had one. It's like, oh, that's a neat little thing, right? Let me see. I think I still. Did I show you the AOL stuff? Did I bring those the other day? Oh, wow. You are in for a treat. You are in for a walk down the street. Yeah. So once upon a time, America Online sent these kind of things to every household in America, right? So this, does anybody know what this is? What is it? It's a floppy disk. Does anyone know what size it is? Because the size was in inches, they used to call these. So, yeah, well, don't just guess. I mean, if you know what, you know what. That's, this was a 3.5 inch floppy disk. And back in the day, we were very glad to have these. These held about a meg and a half, like 1.44 megs for standard density, which was a huge step up from the bigger ones, the thin black uh, five and a quarter inches, which only held 90K. So these were awesome. We were like, wow, I can pack so much data on these. Like a meg. Anyway, so yeah, we were glad to have these. But I brought those in for another class where I actually do talk briefly about America Online. Anyway, so flash memory, Flash memory is pretty neat because compared to those, right, it's this tiny little stick that you know, the first one I saw was like a 4 meg or 8 meg. It's a tiny little thing and it's like, wow, that's awesome. That's the future. Okay, and here we are still using them. But flash memory is great for storage. It's great for reading. It's great for writing. But it's very slow for performing computations where the memory has to change frequently. If you want to read a bunch of stuff, it's pretty quick. You just pull data from what's there. If you want to write to it, it's not too bad. But if you're doing a lot of little tiny computations like adding numbers together and giving you the results and stuff, no, it's terrible for that. It can't handle that kind of traffic. Anyway, so you use it for storage and retrieval. And we've all seen them, you know, USB drives, flash drives, thumb drives, whatever you want to call them. Okay. RAM, there are some different models. Okay, so back in the day, we just had ordinary RAM. We just called it RAM, and that's, that's what it was. At some point down the road, Somebody came up with a new, better version of it that they called Dynamic RAM. And Dynamic RAM was faster than ordinary RAM, and they gave it a catchy name of DRAM, right? Sounds like he could be, like, leading some kind of punk band or something, okay? So DRAM was a big thing back when, like 25 years ago. But now, you are very unlikely to see DRAM, except, again, if you go into your grandparents' attic and dig out one of their old machines, yeah, it might be there. Uh, I mean, no machines have shipped with that, with DRAM for probably 15 years or so. What replaced it was synchronous RAM, or synchronous dynamic RAM, SDRAM. Now, SDRAM is fat, well, that's, a, that did, that did uh, replace, but it's also, uh, yeah, DDR. So, it's faster, that's the main thing, and it's also much more expensive, okay? Now, when you see it marketed, and you say, what kind of RAM am I getting? You'll see a DD4 number with it, right? So the current one that's out there uh, that's pretty common is DDR4. I think DDR, DDR5 is available now, but if it's not, it's right on the cusp. Uh, DDR4 basically is four doubles faster than ordinary dynamic RAM. So the first one that came out was DDR, right? right? Your, your first uh, SD RAM was twice as fast. And I'll show you, I'll explain briefly how it works. So, inside, and this is, this is computer engineering type stuff, so you don't, I'm not gonna ask you detailed stuff about this on the exam, but it may help you remember why things are the way they are. Okay, so every little bit of RAM, okay, so this is one byte. How many bits are in a byte? Who knows basic computer stuff? How many bits are in a byte? Eight, correct, okay? Eight bits. And bit, in case you don't know, is a binary digit, okay? Binary digit can be one or zero, which leads to the joke, there are... Okay. 
usually there, there's a little rolling wave of light laughter. It starts in the front with the people who get it, and eventually other people get it. Okay, so one zero is binary for two. Okay, so that that's the joke. I didn't say it was a good joke. I said it was a joke. Don't don't go asking the university for your money back. Okay. Anyway, what goes on in these wires? There's eight wires going in. Doot, doot, doot. What's that? All right then. And we're gonna do the uh, copy and paste. What's that? What's what? What's so funny? All right. Oh, is it a moth or a dragonfly? Oh, if it's a moth, then we're all doomed. <laughs> okay. All right. So basically, at a microscopic circuit level, there's eight little wires going in there. And each of those, you know, ends in a switch can be held up as a one or a zero, right? Without getting too into the architecture of it. Now, when the signals come in, they're not going to be perfectly synchronized. Some are going to start a little earlier or later than others, and some there's going to be a little window where how long it takes till the signal crests and the chip is, you know, the memory is exactly sure that the signal actually happened. There's a little bit of variation in there, okay? Variation in time of start, stop, peak. All that kind of thing, all that kind of action, creates some variability in how long the uh, memory has to wait to be sure that the full signal along all eight wires happens, okay? Synchronizing just means that, number one, they happen at shorter intervals and in a tighter band, right? So synchronization makes the signaling happen in a tighter window, okay? And that's how it gets faster, basically. It's more precise. They tend to all happen at about the same time and more simultaneously. Okay, That's the synchronization, and that's basically how the RAM operates so much faster. If you tighten that window and all eight signals are happening in shorter intervals and hitting at about the same time, then the memory can process more instructions per second. Okay? All right. So... That's what synchronous RAM is. Static RAM is a little different. And static RAM is kind of an odd case. Now, unlike your other types, these are your basic RAM that, again, need power applied every few milliseconds. Whoa, I saw it go. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't require constant power. Now, how long it exactly takes, you know, hours, days, weeks, it can go a while without power. Eventually, yeah, it will degrade in a way that hard drives and flash ROMs don't but it can last actually a pretty long time without power. Advantages, it's faster than uh, dynamic RAM. Static RAM is actually the fastest with uh, one caveat. And it does use less power and thus it uses less power, so less heat, there's less of a problem there. But static RAM, weirdly, it's also bulkier. It takes up more physical space. And even though it's faster, if it gets into a bigger space, if it goes more than like a tiny speck of the stuff, then the time it takes for signals to traverse the wires that are physically longer actually uh, negates that speed advantage. Okay, so static RAM is faster in very small quantities. And because of that, it's used for the caches on the CPU. So when you buy a computer, you'll often see it has, you know, so however many megs for uh, L1, L2 cache to basically to speed up the core processing unit. That's one. The other one is L3. L3, since you have multi-core uh, computers these days, L3 uh, cache is designed to support groups of, uh, groups of cores. So it's kind of shared among them. L1 or L2 is for a particular one. So when you see the computers and you say, oh, it has some cache memory, yeah, that's what it's for. Some super fast stuff that's attached directly to the CPU. So instructions, you know, that happen over and over and, yeah, you can do them really fast with that. Okay, so those are your three subtypes of RAM. You should know what they are. Questions on that? Questions on this is our basic kind of, uh, kind of memory. No? All right, well, moving on a little bit. Next thing is RAID. Anybody heard of RAID? Yeah? 
What do we know about raid? Oh, okay. Uh, no, those are different. Those it, actually those behave more like RAM. Your solid state drives, yeah, they behave more more like RAM, except it's permanent. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know I should probably revise the slides and update them and talk a little bit more about solid state drives, but. For the purposes of Facebook, Facebook hasn't really made, because it's more, they're more expensive, right? So you guys know what solid state drives are, right? They, they do the same, fulfill the same role as a hard drive, but basically they use like computer chips. They use, you know, transistors and stuff. They're not the, you know, a spinning wheel like hard drives. And yeah, most devices ship with them these days. Uh, I got a old tiny tablet here. It's not that old, but it's about, I don't know, probably like five years old, give or take. And yeah. This one has solid state drive, so they've been around for a little while, but they're more expensive. Uh, yeah, they're a little more expensive than hard drives. That's probably gonna come down in the very near future as well. But for the moment, Facebook's operations, yeah, they have all this stuff on hard drives. They still use the hard drives. They're not gonna go out and buy like six exabytes worth of solid state drive storage at this point. Anyway, good, good question, good question. Okay, so RAID though. RAID stands for Redundant Arrays of Independent Disks. And the idea with a RAID array is you have essentially a box that has multiple hard drive volumes in it. Okay, so physically on the inside, the disks are independent, right? There's a bunch of different disk cylinders spinning around in there. They have one single interface for input and output, I.O. input output. And logically, right, in terms of how the system works, they operate like a single unit. So you send some file to the RAID device, you don't have to worry about which particular drive volume you're sending it to unless you really need to dig in there, right? Ordinary casual users, you write a volume to the hard drive, you don't have to care which hard drive volume it's written to. Okay, now, with RAID devices, there are different operational models. You can emphasize write speed, how fast you can write a file to the drives. You can emphasize read speed, how fast you can read data from the files, or reliability, how likely it is you know, that basically some error will occur or uh, given like some, there's some fixed chance that a hard drive might shit itself. The question is, well, how can I provide some redundancy? How can I provide backup? That's basically what you do for liability. So that's essentially what we're doing. And there are three uh, techniques for that. Number one is striping. Number two is mirroring. Number three is parity. And we'll briefly discuss those. Okay. So let's say for a moment, we have this RAID device. Okay. And inside the RAID device, we have one, well, I guess I'll just draw, I'll draw the two cylinders. I'll draw one and then make copies, I'll make a few copies. Okay, so we got our four hard drive volumes there. Now, let's go through our, our three techniques. I'll do them and I'll color code them. So number one, striping, okay? Striping is where you break a file into pieces and store one piece per drive, okay? This makes it happen faster. This makes writing happen faster. This makes reading happen faster. Okay. For example, here's a big file. And I'll draw, draw a picture of it. Original file. Okay. And drive one gets a piece. Drive two gets a piece. Drive three gets a piece. Drive four gets a piece. Okay. And basically, approximately multiplies speed by the number of file segments. Okay, so if I'm saving it to four drives, 
I can write it about four times as fast as if I were writing it all to OneDrive. It's a little bit not quite that fast because you have the seek time in the hard drive. Anytime you're moving to a new location, you got to incur that seek time. And you're going to do that on all four. But it's, you know, it's pretty close, right? If you're talking a big file, you know, then, yeah, it's, it's going to be about four times as fast if you write it to four drive volumes for both reading and writing. Okay, so striping makes the RAID device work faster. Okay, but effect on reliability, reliability gets much worse. Any drive failure results in loss of entire usable file, right? We can see how that is. In most cases, right, you don't specifically break up a file into segments. It's one thing that you need the whole thing in place. If any of these drive volumes goes bad, right, physically stops working, you lose access to every file that has a segment on that drive. Okay? So striping works faster, less reliable, like a lot of things in life. Okay. Number two, mirroring. Mirroring means making copies of the file on multiple drives, okay? Obviously, increases the workload, okay? Now, if you do it in parallel, it can happen at about the same time, right? So the question is, if the RAID device isn't busy, no real extra delay, right? Because if nobody else is doing anything, you want to write one file and you're not doing anything else with the device, it's not really going to take any extra time. But if the RAID device is busy, there's a lot of other stuff going on, eventually that extra workload, right, is going to add up and make somebody wait for something to happen. The RAID device is busy then, you know, can multiply the delay by the number of copies made, okay? So, the RAID uh, in, uh, in mirroring, if our file looks like this, zoop, okay, every one of these devices that I have it mirrored to would get the full file. Let's push you back a bit. I can grab you. Maybe I can. I saw it there. There we go. There we go. Great. And another one there. Okay. Striping and mirroring. Questions about these? These are your core core things. Now, of course, I'll, I'll add one last note. Reliability is much improved, okay, because backups, because everything you have is backed up automatically. So if one of these drive volumes goes bad, you still have these extra copies in place. Yes? Where is the information stored that is going to come with a file backup? Well, that's inherently in the file. Yeah, most likely you do, or in the file directory. But it would say, well, what usually happens is that the end of each segment of a file has a pointer to where the next part of the file is stored, right? That's typically the way it's done, like on your hard drive. Yeah, so like every sector in the file where data is stored, it has a little bit there that says, and here's where the next bit is where you look at it. Yeah, so it'd be something like that. Except instead of saying, well, it's stored, you know, all in this, I, you'd have to include a thing for, and the other part is stored over here. Other questions? Okay, so this is all clear? Okay. Now, the last thing, which is a little tricky, is something called parity. Okay, and I'm going to try to do parity. What number, what color can I? I'm going to do parity in bright blue because it looks different. Okay. Parity is a fancy word for checking that, right? Methods for checking that the file data is uncorrupted, okay? Not all messed up. 
And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. But let me ask, we're going to start with a simple question. How many copies of something do you need to make sure that, you know, the original is correct? So obviously, if I have one copy and something changes to it, I don't know whether it's the original or whether something went bad, right? Because I only have the one copy. What about if I have two copies? Is two enough? Would you think two is enough? So if I have two images, let's say I have image one, and then I make a copy of it. And it has a big red dot there. I don't know, do I? I don't know if the original was correct or if the original had a big dot. I don't know, just by looking at those two files. I could include some supplementary data, like some kind of checksum, but for the moment we're not saying we're doing that, okay? So I don't know. I don't know which one of those is correct. Does this make sense? But if I have a third copy, and the third copy looks like this, then I'm gonna say, you know what? I have three copies, and two of them look the same, and one of them looked different, one of them looks different, and it's theoretically possible, but vanishingly unlikely, that these two copies would have the same error in the exact same place, right? And that's actually more or less the way parity works. This is why most organizations, when they wanna hold on to data, they keep a triple copy for that reason. Because a checksum, a checksum will allow you to verify that something went wrong. But a checksum, if people don't know it, a checksum is basically, if you have a long string of numbers, you perform some mathematical operations like a sum, and you come up with a small number at the end that uh, corresponds to that whole string of data. And basically, if something in that original data changes, then the formula that it processes through won't match the checksum anymore. But you won't know exactly where the problem happened. Okay? You'll know something is wrong, but you don't know what is wrong. And this is where parity comes in. With parity, you can say, ah, I know that this big red dot here is wrong. These two copies are correct. Okay, so when you want to keep your data, you know, it's one thing to recognize that an error happened, and that's great for like data transmission over a network. You want to make sure everything got there correctly. But for storage and making sure that it still is correct and what went wrong and correcting it, you need parity. Yes? So parity, in a sense, just points out which Yeah, it allows you to recognize when some, what went wrong in a file if something did. Yeah, okay? Now, for parity, in some sense, we basically need to keep a triple copy. And there's different ways where th through that can happen. But again, in some sense, we need to keep, you know, one original copy, one backup copy, and either a third copy or some kind of mathematical correspondence between the two. What this means, reading is fast. With parity, I'm going to add, add some text here. Reading speed is unchanged. Okay, You pick a copy and you read from it. You pick any copy and read it. But write speed is greatly slowed. Because any change must happen to all copies, okay? And depending on what specific parity technique you're doing, you know, it could be more like striping, it could be more like mirroring, or there could actually be some complex math involved. There's different operations, but it's definitely gonna be slower. It's gonna be slower because if you change one file, you have to make sure that the copies are changed in the same way, okay? All right. So those are our three techniques. Striping, break a file into pieces, put a piece on each hard drive volume, read and write much faster, okay? Mirroring, you basically make multiple copies of the file on separate hard drive volumes. The speed could be about the same or it could be slowed, right? If the hard drive is busy, then you know everybody's gotta wait for other stuff to go on. So generally, yeah, you can assume it's gonna slow things down somewhat. 
but you have better reliability. That's the point of mirroring. So striping for speed, mirroring for reliability, and parity is adding an extra layer of reliability, right? Because if something goes wrong, you can check it. If you just have mirroring, right, and something goes wrong, yeah, you can eventually, you know, you can check and see what's going on there. But parity, there are different techniques where you can, you know, recognize, oh yeah, this file is corrupted, something went wrong. With mirroring, if you're just reading a file, you're not really gonna know that. Yes? Yeah, these are different techniques you can use, right? If you were just going to treat it like one big hard drive that happened to have multiple partitions, then you wouldn't use striping, wouldn't use mirroring, right? But these are techniques that RAID devices can use. Okay, now if you're interested, RAID devices are still out there. They're still, you know, pretty widely used. If you're interested, you know, you can look up what the different categories are, but this is just enough to get started being, you know, happy and knowing about hardware and stuff. Quest, other questions? Okay. This is about as uh, techy as the hardware gets. So if you kept up with that, then we're probably all right. Okay. Next thing, hard drive speed. Okay, so we talked about how a hard drive is constructed and how it runs. And remember, everything that goes on in a hard drive is fundamentally physical, right? It's like a really fast uh, piece of, uh, you know, a vinyl record player. It's fast relative to that, but it still happens at physical speeds, not electronic speeds. So typically there's a few milliseconds uh, for where stuff happens. Other stuff, sequential operations, right? Every time you bounce around the drive head from one track, one sector to another, it's going to incur that seek time. It's going to incur a few milliseconds delay. But once you start reading along a continuous track, you don't have to move the drive head again. So the, the disc spins around and the drive head stays where it is. And that's going to happen much faster. Still at physical speeds, but you don't incur that few milliseconds seek time. Which leads, here's this. All right, so this is a list of uh, useful computer times. You don't have to memorize this. Oh, shit, wrong link. That's a different one. This is the one I want. Uh, so un the fellow has the unfortunate name of Jay Boner. I would not have picked that name for myself unless I was going into porn or something. Anyway, uh, this, oh, you guys can't see it. Hold on. Okay, there we go. So here's some stuff in terms of latency, basically how long it takes for things to happen. So if we're doing an L1 cache reference, right, that's that static RAM. Remember I said static RAM was super fast? And this is from 2012, so even several years ago, probably faster now. Took half a nanosecond. Right? I already did like a million uh, L1 cache references in that time. So that's, that's how fast that is. L2 cache reference, relatively slow, seven nanoseconds, right? I don't know what they're doing, but they're going a lot slower. Main memory reference, we're talking about doing stuff in RAM, looking up something from regular RAM, 100 nanoseconds, okay? So that's a lot slower than your L1, L2 caches. But still, you compare that to hard drive, right? The disk seek time, they call here 10 milliseconds. Probably a little faster, right? Probably more in that five to eight millisecond range. But yeah, it could be 10 milliseconds, which is way, 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 way faster, right? So 10 million nanoseconds compared to 100. So disk drives are way slower than RAM. Now, if you start reading stuff, uh, reading one meg sequentially from the disk only takes 20 million nanoseconds, 20 million, 20 milliseconds. So once you start reading, it's relatively fast, right? But, you know, the, the seek time is where the big delay happens. If you're reading a lot of small files, if you're reading a lot of like 1K files from your hard drive, that's going to take a long time. If you're reading a lot of big files, it's going to be a lot faster. Okay, it's still going to be way slower than RAM, right? Reading one meg sequentially from main memory, uh, from RAM, 250, uh, now, 250 microseconds, so a quarter of a millisecond. So it's going to be way, way faster than a hard drive. Okay, but again, don't try to memorize those numbers. Just have a rough idea. You know, RAM is way faster than hard drives. That's the key takeaway. And that's why we use it for the role that we use it. Okay. Okay, so next slide here. So, hard drives... Right, they have a lot more capacity. So if you want to spend, you know, 
X dollars, you're going to get about 100 times as much capacity as you would for the equivalent amount of RAM. And I looked these up recently, and they're pretty good numbers. Obviously, they're variations in terms of quality and stuff, but one terabyte hard drive, you buy a good one for 50 bucks, maybe 40 if you're willing to shop around. Uh, eight gigs of RAM is about 40 bucks, okay? But you start saying, I want a terabyte of RAM. Well, I found a link to a server on Amazon, server memory on Amazon, 24,000 for a, a terabyte of RAM. So, you know, almost a thousand times more expensive. So, but hard drives are also way slower, right? Again, depending on what you're doing. So if you're uh, pulling big files, reading big files from a hard drive, it's gonna be less worse than RAM. If you're reading a lot of tiny files, it's gonna be way, way, way worse, okay? But anyway, that's where I pull those numbers in. But for a lot of real-time applications, it's just too slow to use hard drives, right? If you're, uh, for example, if you're trying to play a video game, you're trying to play Angry Birds, and every time you pull the bird back, it has to pull some image from the hard drive, that's gonna be super slow. You don't wanna live with that, right? That's why you do it in RAM, you don't pull all that directly from your hard drive. You read it from your hard drive into RAM, then read it from RAM when you need it. Okay, other stuff, right? <laughs> Server farms. Server farms are already gigantic. Right, you'd need a lot more. You'd need a lot more uh, machines. So, for example, simple case. Okay, I'm gonna pull this. Suppose, suppose you have a very popular image only stored on one hard drive, okay? Or suppose we say very popular content. It doesn't even matter what it doesn't have to be an image. Suppose you have very popular content stored on one hard drive. What's the maximum number of actions you can allow per second? Max number actions is going to be limited by seek time and read time. So roughly, if it's one megabyte, It'll take about 25 milliseconds to read, okay, to find and read. Which means one hard drive can only support whoop, about 40 actions per second. If there are 40, more than 40 people wanting to do stuff, wanting to pull stuff from that hard drive, it simply can't support that. So, hypothetically on Facebook, right, we can figure out, you know, the maximum number of simultaneous users you can support by the number of hard drives you have. If they're all, you know, periodically grabbing content from this. But this is what it is. You can uh, support 40 actions per second. For example, if you have an image that's popular, right, because whatever, because it's Kim Kardashian's butt or something, then, of course you're gonna need multiple copies of that on multiple hard drives, right? If a million people, okay, so suppose, just some quick back of the envelope, man. Suppose there are 10 million people that want to see it in an hour. 10 million divided by 3,600 is about 300, no, is about 3,000, actually close enough to 3,000, you can expect to need the image replicated to about 100, let's say 75 hard drives, okay? And that's, and that's all those drives will do for that hour, okay? This is a problem. This, if you try to operate a system like this with like lots of access to the same stuff, hard drives just aren't going to cut it, right? You've got to support it with RAM because they can only support so many simultaneous actions. And the reason why is that drive head's bouncing around and seeking all the time. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so hard drives, you know, if you just use that, that's going to impose a pretty uh, bad limit on your system. Okay. So... Yeah, we're going to take one minute. This is what we already covered in memory grids, but I'll mention it. 
Remember the other day when I talked about you had a system that has RAM, it's supported by RAM, and uh, when necessary it operates with a uh, with a hard drive in place. So we'll come back. We'll talk about we'll talk about this on uh, Monday in memory grids. Okay.